Welcome back to the Motorhome Matt podcast. I'm Keith Gooden. And I'm Motorhome Matt. And this podcast is brought to you, of course, with the kind help of thatleisureshop.com. And we'll be uh, talking about their January sale in this podcast and future ones, won't we? Yeah, and Christmas deals as well. (laughs) So stand by for that. Uh, In today's podcast, we're talking about professionally cleaning your motorhome. But before we get into that, let's get into the news and Mm. some serious news, actually, Matt, for people people working in the industry, also for people who, you know, own their own motorhomes and need to maintain them. Market shrinkage. We had that great expansion of the market during the pandemic where people couldn't take foreign holidays, weren't allowed to cross borders. And I'm going to use that word, the staycation took hold. The motorhome and caravanning and camping industry took full advantage of that and was able to supply the market. But then people started taking their holidays after the lockdowns were lifted and borders opened. Mm. It's not been easy for your industry, has it? No, it's been a strange time, particularly for the motorhome hire business. It's been a strange year. Uh, We're down certainly on the last two years as we come to the end of a financial year. We've been reviewing what's happened over the last year. And we're ahead of 2019. But we're certainly down on 2020. That was a bumper year for us. And, of course, we were only open for six months. Uh, It was a really strange time. We we went back to work in end of June, beginning of July, and it just went absolutely gangbusters right up until end of October when Boris put us back into lockdown, remember, in November? And we just didn't stop. It literally was nonstop. And we were grateful of another lockdown, to be quite honest, because we could have a lie down. Uh, and then 2021 came along and not quite as good a year, which we you know, we thought that might be the case, uh, but still a great year. But this year has been odd because I think people have taken holidays that they paid for perhaps two years ago and they haven't taken a motorhome hire holiday like perhaps they they you know they were going to um what's really interesting though is the number of inquiries are up tenfold for next year which i i, I mean i mean i find that incredible up tenfold it's incredible that's so, it that is incredible that's yeah I, and that's not an exaggeration so could it be that people who 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 did holiday uh, using motorhome caravan or camping a couple of years ago, they've used their holidays up that they had booked for foreign holidays, but they're coming back to, I think so. to doing it here. I think there's an element of some people coming back to it. There's also an element, a big element of people who've never done it before. I thought we'd flush them all out in 2020. You know, evidently not. We have an amazing brochure in the Motome Holiday Company, which is completely free and it's 48 pages of lots of inspiration and insights into how a motorhome hire holiday works. It's a fantastic brochure, and we would normally send out you know five or six hundred a year. Uh, we've been we're into nearly four thousand for next year, and I've actually spoken to a dozen people that have requested a brochure who are new bits of data to us, and I've asked them the question: you know, What did you think of it? But why have you requested a brochure? And every one of them said. Well, we're thinking of doing a motorhome holiday next year. We've never done it. Well, that's good news. But you, as an expert in this industry, are firmly of the opinion that your universe has shrunk. Yeah, I think it has in the last year. I think the, de- the demand is still there, certainly for people looking to buy. Um, that you know, We've talked at length, haven't we, about delays on new vehicle arrival, and that's still the case, and it's still going to be the case you know, going into the next few years, I think there's going to be you know more challenges. So ordering a new motorhome is going to mean a delay in perhaps a year or more, uh, perhaps two years even. So second-hand market remains strong. I think there was a huge demand because people couldn't do a holiday to Costa del whatnot, so they went and hired or bought a motorhome. And I think now they're kind of you know they're starting to sell them, um, and the amount of people that are in a motorhome will shrink back a bit. I still think the market will be bigger now than it's ever been, uh, and I think as a higher business, which is quite different to the purchasing model really, but I think that the number of vehicles available to hire in the UK boomed certainly are fleet hire insurance company that we use would vouch for that uh, where people went and bought a motorhome and they thought let's put it on here one of these kind of third party sites like an airbnb type model um, where we can rent it out and go make some money from it as well and i think they've you know they've perhaps done that and thought ah, it's not quite as lucrative as we thought in fact it was blooming hard work uh, and they probably won't do that next year i'm intrigued to see 
what percentage of that new business with our insurance company that we use doesn't renew in the spring. So if you can convert some of those uh, record inquiries, it's just the last 12 months where everything's been sort of, I suppose, getting back on an even key. Yeah, it's a bit of a reset, isn't it? It's like a pendulum swing. We come from one extreme almost to the other. Yeah, every, everybody wanted back. to hire a motorhome because they couldn't yeah. go abroad. And now, yeah. But it's, I mean, I'm really encouraged by the number of people that have made an inquiry for next year. It is record numbers with us. Uh, and so we're feeling really buoyant about next year. And in fact, we've set targets as a team for the business, which are double what we've done this year. And that's our team target, which we're all going to work towards. And I think we'll do it. You know, it's a fantastic team. I'm biased, of course, uh, but it is a fantastic business with a great offering. And I think we will see more people come to it, remarkably still for the first time. But well, I'm the same with a canal boat. I've never done that before. And I'm inquiring now about doing a canal boat holiday with the family for next year, which I think would be great fun. Something different to a motorhome, which of course my wife wants to go on a canal boat as well. Does she? Yeah, but well, we, we've never done that. No, and, yeah, no. So I mean, but interestingly, I bet for the canal boat industry, well, I know for a fact they had a huge boom time as we did in 2020, and I bet they think, oh, we thought we flushed you all away, you know, and you all came and took a canal boat holiday. I didn't. Why is that? Why do I want to do one now? And I think it's the same for us with our motorhome prospects. Is you know, it's the same people. A lot of people didn't do anything. They didn't go anywhere. Didn't take a holiday at all. No. Um, a lot of companies aren't going to survive this, are they? No, they're not. No, already we've seen several friends of mine. Indeed, some didn't even make it through the summer. We walked into the summer with you know lots of space in the diary, thinking, "Hang on a minute, what's going on?" And friends of mine who had a motorhome hire business in in Scotland just shut the doors and said, you know, we're not going to carry on. It's not viable. I know several others who have made that decision and they won't be running again next year. Um, One company I know is going to take a year off and just see what happens and maybe come back to it. And we've read online on the website gmw.nl that one of these platform motorhome hire companies they're called Camp 2 and LBV, have gone into bankruptcy. Uh, and they're a big player. Um, and so it's, jo- it's not just limited to the UK. This is a Europe-wide uh, kind of trend of this market shrinkage. And I think it's been a real you know, experience for many motorhome travel, leisure and tourism businesses this year. It's not just unique to motorhomes. But one thing a couple of years ago did teach a lot of us is how beautiful this country is and that uh, those people, um, as you say, with their inquiries are thinking of holidaying again. Brexit has been and gone and everything's settled there, so we know what we have to do when we cross borders. Yeah. It should be looking up, shouldn't it? It should be looking up. And, of course, this recessive climate that we're being you know, talked about, mm. talked about all the time, and we're finding ourselves in... In reality, in every recession, UK tourism booms because it's perceived as a cost-effective great holiday. And post-recession, it always has a boom as well. So I'm confident that you know this awful climate we find ourselves in, and let's not get caught up too much in that, but I think a UK-based holiday is, in reality, a more cost-effective way to spend your leisure time than flying off to Costa del whatnot. You know, we, I've talked before about taking my kids abroad, and it's thousands and thousands of it pounds. Is, it is. It's a lot, a lot of money, and the airline companies aren't finding it easy uh, either. And of course, you're brilliantly placed here, aren't you? Because you're the gateway to the southwest, yep. which is one of the most beautiful parts of England. It is indeed. Yeah, of course. Again, we're biased, but Devon, Cornwall, South Wales, the whole of the south of England, it's all within really, really easy reach. Within an hour or two, you know, you are sat on a beach with a beautiful view. And a gin and tonic. Love it. <laughs> so this is the Motor Home Podcast brought to you with thatleisureshop.com. I did let a little bit of a can out of bag talking about uh, January sales. We're going to be talking about Christmas gifts, actually. I, like I said, there is a January sale, but what we want to talk about today is Christmas gifts. So pardon me for letting your cat out of the bag, but now you know. Let's talk about the February NEC show, um, which last year was sold out in advance. Caravan Camping and Motorhome Show, 21st to the 26th of February, because you watch, because you listen to this podcast, you get a discount. You do. Just use the code MATT, M-A-T-T, on their website, ccmshow.co.uk, and you'll get a discount on your ticket, down to £11.50. And kids under 15 are free. 
And what's that website again? ccmshow.co.uk. And where that little box is, it says discount code. Put M-A-T-T in there and you'll get your discount. There's also a show in Manchester, Matt. We are. We're going to the Manchester the Caravan Motorhome Holiday Show. Uh, which runs in Manchester from the 12th to the 15th of January. Thank you to Tottington Motor Company, who've asked us to partner with them on their stand, and we'll be at the show. Uh, that show's completely free, so head on up to Manchester Central. Uh, it tends to be a show uh, with northern businesses, and mostly the northern dealerships attend, and it tends to be visited by people of the north, uh, because it's a local show to them, but it's a fantastic show. Uh, and it's one definitely to go to. And, of course, you get free access into the Destinations Holiday and Travel Show as well, which is next door. Uh, and that's a brilliant way of getting inspiration for your European and UK holiday. So go and have a visit there as well. And I'm speaking in the Expert Theatre at that event, so that'd be fun. Fantastic. Let's talk about our Christmas gifts. That Thatleasureshop.com sponsors the podcast. And if you are thinking about something for somebody in your family who loves motorhoming, caravanning or camping, this is the place to come. It is indeed. Just head to thatleasureshop.com. And there, if you enter the code MOTORHOMEMAT... We'll give you £10 off when you spend 100 quid. How's that? So that's the shop. OK, Motorhome Matt is your code for that. You get a tenner off. And if you're looking for Christmas gifts, I mean, I never tire of looking in your warehouse down the shelves and seeing the innovation and the fantastic stuff people can buy are, uh, yeah. for, for, for enjoying themselves in this industry. And it's not just for people who own a motorhome camper van or caravan. There's some brilliant gifts there, you know, for anyone. You know, torches, uh, I love the little ottoman. I know that's a favourite of yours as well. That what, the one that looks like a, a log. A log. It's fantastic. <laughs> you could use it in any garden. I, I've can. never seen that anywhere before. And it folds up. Uh, but when it's unfolded, it looks like a tree stump. Yeah, we sell these shelters as well. Quest's Pro Shelter, it's called. It's like a gazebo for your garden that folds flat. They go up in seconds. They are fantastic. Sold out of them today, so we've got more coming. They are really popular. And they are really heavily discounted as well. So, yeah, go and check them out. OK, so Christmas gifts at that leisure shop dot com. The code is Motorhome Matt. Have you got that? Motorhome Matt. OK, let's get into the main body of the podcast, shall we? Today on the Motorhome Matt podcast brought to you with that leisure shop dot com. We are talking about professionally cleaning a motorhome. We have had in the last seven weeks or so the most awful weather haven't we it has rained a lot rain and if you take anything out or any roads it gets covered in uh, mud and dirt and you really do need to pep up your motorhome or caravan don't you yeah i drove down cheddar gorge yesterday and it was it was it was a wash (laughs) <laughs> it was it's like a river. It's been unbelievable. We had a summer where we didn't get, you know, a drop of rain. And uh, since the end of October, it, I mean, it's been a deluge in this part yeah, of the country. Of course, at this time of year, that makes your motorhome or caravan filthy, isn't it? It's tempting just to go and squeeze some shampoo on the roof and let it wash itself, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and what's wrong with doing that, then? Well, no, <laughs> nothing, really. So tell me, what should I be doing? Then? Student car wash, that would be... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we, we get lots of questions about using a pressure washer, and that's a good one because you know people say, "Oh no, you mustn't use a pressure washer." But why? Well, you can damage the sealant, of course. Yeah, you've mentioned that before. Yeah, yeah be and careful with the pressure washer. Another thing, if you're cleaning the roof, yeah. it can it can spray down on the roof light, and a roof light often isn't sealed deliberately, so it can breathe inside. And if you when you slam the door, the air can come out otherwise you you create a a vacuum and it could potentially pop a window out of the frame Um, and that's why they're not sealed tight shut and and also just to ventilate them but that pressure washer if you get it wrong on the angle wrong you can go down and up inside the pressure washer and then soak your bed so you have to be really careful when you when you're cleaning the roof but you can do your wheels and stuff you can do the wheels. We we use a pressure washer or pressure washers in the hire business, but our pressure washers, they're thousands of pounds. They're not the kind of, you know, fifty pound ones that you get in B and Q. They are thousands of pounds. And we actually down down rate the pressure and change the, the jet shape as well. And B and Q do supply very good pressure washers, <laughs> as indeed do many other shops. They do. Thank you, B and Q. I've got yeah. several yeah. at home. Yeah. But, but yeah, for they're cleaning not ne- they're not necessarily good for this job, are they? No, no. And and you know, we are unpack that a bit more with our guest in a second but you know also we get questions about climbing on the roof can i get on the roof to clean my motorhome or caravan potentially 
You could, yes. But really, that's about understanding what's the roof made out of. Is it safe to get on there in terms of the construction? And is it safe to get on there in terms of slipping off as well? That's what you've got to be careful of. Um, if it's a van conversion, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, that metal roof will dent very, very easily. The number of camper van conversions that have a ladder on the back door that I've seen, and at the top of the ladder on the roof are two beautiful little dents, perfectly knee-shaped, where people have climbed the ladder, knelt on the roof, and then put two big dents in it. They dent so easily. So if your if your ledger vehicle's made of timber or it's an older vehicle, I'd be really, really careful. And if it's got a hump in the roof, definitely don't be climbing on that. You know, they're just not structurally sound. If you have to climb on the roof, then I'd definitely be keeping to the edges. Better still, lean a ladder against it, tie a, a cushion or pillow around the ladder, and stand on the ladder and clean the roof. Uh, be careful. Um, ladder injuries account for a lot of visits to A and E. So one thing's for certain, Nat. Actually, from what you're talking about here, it's it's. I think good to unpack today hmm. what a professional clean is, what they offer, and why you should have one. Yeah, that's right. And what chemicals do they use? I mean, we get lots of questions about how do I get the black streaks off. You know, they can be really, really persistent. You know, they're really hard to get off. And there are specialist chemicals that will. You know, help lift that black streak from the roof. And the reason they appear, of course, is the dirt that just appears on the roof and the rain makes that dirt travel down the side walls and it dries into the paint. Um, and, you know, we get questions about the chemicals. Why are they so expensive? Why can't I use the fairy liquid washing up liquid? You know, what's wrong with that? Well, I caught up with George from Mars Valeting. Is a local valeter that we use, and he helps us keep our hire fleet looking tip-top. And I started by asking George, what is the issue with fairy liquid? So George, tell me about washing up liquid. What's your view on using it to clean any ledger vehicle? Uh, no. It's <laughs> <laughs> washing up liquid was designed uh, for its intended use for washing dishes, pots and pans. Not your pride and joy motorhome or any vehicle at all so it's a big no-no and we got chester in the background having a scratch which is what you can hear <laughs> rattling around is his collar chester's a seven month old lab he's fine he's fine so what does washing up liquid do then to what why what damage does it do well it's designed like i said to clean dishes pots and pans so on a motorhome or a vehicle it can ruin anything. It can take any protective coatings off, any waxes, any polishes. Um, it can ruin rubbers, seals, silicones, etc. So, yeah, it's just a big no-no. When you say it can ruin them, what does it actually do to the rubbers? It can break it down. So, disintegrate, destroy it. And it can actually stain the paint as well, can't it? Uh, I've heard so. Obviously, I've never used it. So, um, <laughs> I've never thankfully witnessed it and I never shall do. No, um, no. So, yeah. Now, another question we often get asked frequently is about using a pressure washer on your motorhome or caravan. Um, what's your view? What should people be aware of if they're planning to use their pressure washer? Because let's face it, it makes a much easier job of it, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I always use a pressure washer. Um, I've had customers in the past concerned and worried about the use of a pressure washer because um, obviously it says in their handbooks not to use pressure washers on their, their motorhomes or caravans. The thing is, you can... Go to B&Q, buy a generic pressure washer, get it out of the box, and it's for garden and car use, so it says. Obviously, I've got a professional pressure washer myself, which most validators use. There's different nozzles, different grades. You can turn the pressure down, etc. obviously, and then it's having the knowledge of how to use any tool in the trade, so to speak. So if you were to get a pressure washer from out of the box with, say, the dirt blaster on it, and go up to your motorhome, you're going to you know, potentially ruin it or, or, or take the sealant out or paint off or lacquer. Um, so, yeah, it, it's knowing what to do with the right tools, like anything, really. I remember many years ago, I bought a pressure washer and cleaned a car, and it actually cut the wheel trim, the plastic wheel mm. trim. It cut through it. Brilliant. That's, that's, that's good going, <laughs> Matt. Well done. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you probably had the, the, the dirt blaster on it, which is designed to clean patios, lift dirt, cut through concrete almost, you know. So, yeah, it's 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 knowing what, what to do. Yeah, so it's about having the right tools for the job, isn't it? Now, we're recording this on a very wet, wintry day. The scenario is I've got my motorhome in storage, mm -hmm. and it might be under a cover. We've talked about covers a lot. But if it's not under a cover, then it's obviously going to be getting dirty, isn't it? And, get, and they get greasy. You, you talk about a maintenance clean. What is a maintenance clean? 
Well, there's there's different levels, obviously, of cleaning, like anything. As a rule, like with your own motorhome, Matt, you had it all protected and cleaned and, and ready for winter storage or winter use. On a monthly basis, every four weeks, we'll go in and we'll, we'll give uh, the motorhomes a wash. So, yeah, a maintenance clean is just to, 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 to keep it from dirt, algae, all sorts of traffic film if the vehicle is actually used during the winter as well so it just maintains it and stops all the build up on the the, the bodywork and the paintwork so to speak and of course as we go into january and february another issue is salt isn't it because we love putting salt on the roads and when it gets icy absolutely yeah salt's a, a nasty nasty thing and obviously the thing is it's not technically just salt as we know it um what to use on the roads it's got different anti-caking agents and things to stop it rotting and breaking down so there's other chemicals within that salt and any sort of surface you know your alloy wheels especially i've seen lots of new cars with corroded alloy wheels and it's just where they're not maintained washed properly no coatings on them and a build-up of or over time salt will absolutely destroy things like that yeah so i want to talk about coatings you mentioned them but just before then one question i've got is how do you fix cloudy headlights <clears throat> Toothpaste and newspaper, is that right? Well, when you were a young lad driving your car around in 1943, maybe, Matt. Yeah, you, you, you might have done such a thing. Um, no, that's, that's me being rude. No, I, I, I've heard people saying the toothpaste. They, they're probably the same people that use washing up liquid to wash their vehicles as well. So we do lots of cloudy headlights throughout the year. Some vary more than others. Some of them are horrifically bad. But nine times out of ten, you can, you can bring them back. It's a matter of different compounds, usually. Sometimes you have to use different abrasive papers, like sandpapers, to bring them back up. And then, obviously, you put a, a protective coat in on it to stop it happening again. So it's literally like a cutting compound and you cut into the plastic to, to clean it, is that it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, within reason. And um, What about faded bumpers as well? Because you, know, you see lots of motorhomes that are older that have been stood around for a bit and they've not got painted bumpers, mm-hmm. particularly the front, and they go really, really grey. They yeah. dull. And I heard you say to me in the past, oh, Matt, we need to feed that. How do you feed a bumper? Well, you, you don't cook it burger and chips, that's, that's for sure. <laughs> there was one time at the Motorhome Holiday Company, I remember doing one for you. The grey plastic bumper was all different shades of grey, in fact. It was horrific. Mm. So again, many different processes of obviously we had to clean it, dry it, and prepare it ready. And then I've got a certain product that you feed effectively into the plastic and uh, it brings it back to life. And that's something you need to repeat, doesn't it, often for over time, because it, it, they tend to fade back again, don't they, I find? Yeah, I mean, if you're using a, a product like we used to get back in the day, like the old uh, Back to Black, which is basically like a silicon spray, that's, that's no good. This is a bit more advanced than that. Going on to coatings, like we will shortly as well, is you can, with a, you know, like if you had a, a modern or new motorhome where the plastics were good, um, you can also ceramic coat those as well. Um, that definitely brings them back to life and keeps them there as well for a longer period of time. But again, like anything, people assume that once it's done, that's it, it's done, you can walk away, oh, it's, it's been coated, it's been protected. You have to maintain things, they have to be looked after, same as anything. Yes. Now you've mentioned the C word, ceramic coating. <laughs> yeah. We get lots of questions about this, and film protection, ceramic coating protection, um, why, does it, why is it so expensive? Um, I can buy this in a bottle and do it myself. You know, why would I bother paying a dealer to do this? Ceramic coating is interesting. And it's actually been around for 4,000 years. It was the Chinese that started doing it. And they used it to coat clay pots uh, to give them a sheen. Um, and there was an enamel coating that was very popular way, way back in time. But it's only really the last couple of decades that it's been kind of used in the automotive industry and leisure industry. Um, I know it was used on the hulls of boats to keep the barnacles off that really sort of sums up what ceramic coat does doesn't it It keeps those alien bodies off the paint but tell me what's the difference between a ceramic coat and a film protection and will it stop my bonnet getting stone chipped a ceramic coat is totally different to uh, a ppf or a film protection people assume with a ceramic coating that the car then or the vehicle rather is bomb proof it's bulletproof anything that hit it will just bounce off that's not true with a PPF or a film, it reduces the, the stone chips on your bonnet, etc., etc. Um, road rash coming up the spray of the side of the car, you know, on the rears of the wings. I've seen lots of damage on vehicles. It stops or reduces that. But again, over time, 
or depending on the size of stones or chips or grit on the road, it can penetrate through that that film, obviously. Ceramic coatings or coatings, ceramics, it's a huge grey area. There's there's It's a minefield out there. There's lots of different products on the market. You can go in and or go online and buy a ceramic coating. You can apply it yourself. There's different levels of ceramic coating. I wouldn't recommend that at all. The reason ceramic coatings are or can be expensive I had a customer the other week, came in, wanted his car ceramic coating. The paintwork under a light or under the sun, in the sun, looked awful. So you have to prepare the paint, get it back to a fantastic standard first. Bring the paint back to life. Take swirl marks out, scratches, removal, you know, that sort of thing. Then apply the coating. The coating's not just a spray-on, wash-off product when you're doing a, a three or four year coating it's applied it then has to cure onto the paintwork then it has to be buffed off with a few cloths and bring that up to a shine but it does have an amazing effect the gloss and the shine in paintwork once a ceramic coating is applied is it, it can be phenomenal now a film is literally like a, a sticky wrap isn't it that's the you, you call it ppf mm-hmm. um that's a that's a sticky wrap that goes over the usually the front of a vehicle and that's what stops stone chips isn't it Um, from occurring whereas a ceramic coat is a liquid it's almost like a liquid glass is that right yeah that's right yeah that's exactly it so the ppf um, paint protection film is basically like a thick cling film or a a vinyl wrap so you can still see the color of your paint through bits of it because you wouldn't necessarily do the whole vehicle some people do Um, but you could do just the front end of it but you can still see the color of your paint through it as it's a it's a clear film you very kindly bought me a ceramic coat for my birthday for our VW T6, um, and it looked fantastic after you'd applied it. But that was only a five or six month treatment, you said to me, um, and you were able to put that on in sort of an afternoon, weren't you? Um, but even that was complicated to apply. When someone's going for a full ceramic coat, that can take sometimes days to prep the vehicle and get it done. Is it worth having? Absolutely. I mean, your vehicle obviously. Um I would say you're quite fortunate that between your staff and myself, we uh, look after your T6 for you, Matt. Um, You do. So, so, yeah, I I applied a a six-month coating to your vehicle. It's applied with a spray bottle and it's rinsed off and and, and buffed up. That's pretty much it. Again, like any coating, I say that's a six-month coating. It will last up to six months, providing you maintain the vehicle properly. properly. If you... Co- um, go spraying TFRs that are really strong or acids or um, TFR or TFR traffic film remover. This is um, this is the lethal stuff that often a drive through car wash with a team of people that treating your car is a quick and easy way, isn't it, to get the dirt off? It's dangerous. It can be. There's again, there's lots of different TFRs on the market. I have heard of people using TFR on interior seats. At some of these car washes um but yeah that's just a no-no you know um the tfr that i use i could use on your vehicle once i'd ceramic coated it and it won't take that coating off no. i've also got a tfr that i use on lorries and trucks that if i did use that on your vehicle it strip everything off the paintwork so we've just had to interrupt the recording because chester the seven-month-old lab has just decided to take a wee on the carpet. What we need is a protective coating on the carpet, George. Absolutely. That can be done, Matt. We can arrange that later. Not a problem. <laughs> That's what we need. So for people going into a dealership looking to buy a motorhome or caravan, they're going to be offered the upsell of a kind of a care package that protects the exterior paint and the interior fabrics. What things do people need to be aware of when they're considering making this purchase? Because there are some key things, aren't there, that really people need to consider before committing that extra spend. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, do your research, ask all the questions, and find out as much information about each individual product that's out there on the market. What questions should they be asking then? What is the product? What's the benefits of the product? What does it do? Why should I have it? How much does it cost? What's the warranty or the guarantee? And what questions should they ask about the application of it? You know, how and who is putting it on? Absolutely. Is it applied just quickly with a a spray and a mist off? I mean, the the, the one we did on your T6, going back to that, was just a, a spray on, leave for a couple of minutes, rinse off and buff, buff up. Yeah, that was a six-month coating. It's not 
a three, four, five year coating. So how's it applied? How is the vehicle prepared before the application? Who's doing it? Is it a fully qualified professional that's doing it or is it some kiddie just out of college that doesn't know what they're doing necessarily I, I doubt that will be the case but again you need to know for your own peace of mind and of course on an older vehicle 10 year old vehicle the paint can be really flat that's the term we use isn't it when it goes dull um, and that if you're going to coat on top of that all you're doing is trapping that kind of marred paintwork underneath aren't you so it needs treating beforehand and that takes time doesn't it absolutely i mean we had one a couple of weeks ago um we had it for six days and all we were doing is just preparing the paintwork so we had to machine polish that with two different cutting compounds like you say the paint was flat it was almost gray it was no color to it no shine whatsoever we've had to bring that paint back to life factory standard then apply the coating but before that like you say you're just sealing in poor quality work or end of life work almost you know George, that's been really useful. Thanks ever so much. So where can people find out more about you if they're looking for a local valeter in the North Somerset and Bristol area? So you can find us on Facebook and Instagram, or you can find us at our website, which is www.milesvalletonservices.co.uk. George, thank you ever so much. Really appreciate your input. Thank you, Matt. Now, if you go into a motorhome dealership, you're probably going to encounter the brand Paintsill, who are one of the most prominent brands in this marketplace, and they partner with dealerships throughout the country. At the recent NEC Motorhome and Caravan Show, I got to catch up with one of its owners and directors, the lovely Lisa. So I'm here with Lisa, uh, with a brand that many of you uh, might be familiar with. Lisa is from Paintsill. Hi, Lisa. Yes, How are hello. you? Hello. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you, Matt? Yeah, really well, See thank you. you. So tell us, for those that don't know about Paintsill, yes. what is it and what does it do? Okay, so uh, we started this business 18 years ago. We do um, a ceramic liquid glass. It's a Gen 3 ceramic liquid glass coat, which we put on the outside of caravans, motorhomes, cars, boats. We put it on all sorts of things. So it's a protection system that we're putting on the outside of the vehicle to protect it, make it easier to keep clean, um, stopping it from dulling, etc. Uh, we do lots and lots of this in this industry. And then we also do the interior fabrics as well with a uh, well-known fabric protector, an American fabric protector um, for stain proofing. Now, a big difference for paint seal from other brands out there is you actually put it on yourselves don't you you yes, don't let the customer we do. do yeah yeah well we find that if we put it if we have specialized trained employed people who put it on um, we know that it's being put on properly then you know there's there's lots of sort of DIY products out there but you know you want a professional job when you're doing it so um, yeah yeah I mean you're spending a lot of money on your vehicle aren't you, yeah. you want to protect it you want to keep it nice so that's what our team do and you ensure then that the standard is kept very high yeah, because your yes. guys are putting and girls are putting it on yeah, for you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, we've got a big team of guys out there, as I say, who are all employed by us. That's what all they do all day, every day. They're not franchised. They're not some contractors. They just do this job every day. So they're specialists in what they do. And that's over brilliant. 18 years, you've accrued a lot of customers. Haven't yeah, you? yeah. So we've got over 80,000 customers. That's incredible. Um, yeah, yeah. We've, we've got lots of people, lots of people coming back, lots of repeat customers. People have had it five, six, seven times. You know, they just keep coming back. They love it. They love it. So it's great for us. Yeah. Brilliant. We'll have great. a great show. Well, Thanks thank for you. Thank taking you the time much. to talk to me. Thank you. Thanks, guys. That was Lisa from Paint Seal. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. It was great. great. Excellent. Brilliant guests, George yeah. and Lisa. Fantastic. I hope that's helped you uh, listening uh, and watching this. Uh, what about prepping for winter and covering the motor? Yeah. Well, of course, once you've cleaned the vehicle, one of the things you then want to do is protect it as it sits there in storage throughout the winter. And a cover is a great idea. A motorhome or caravan cover, they're an inexpensive way of keeping it clean um, and keeping the bird lime, protecting it from UV rays, from tree sap, from birds landing on it as well. Um, and I got challenged the other day, what's bird lime? <laughs> you know bird lime is? It's a nice way of saying poo. <laughs> <laughs> He had no idea what bird lime was. Yeah, and the reason they call it bird lime, it's very serious, actually. Um, seagull poo, in particular, is very corrosive. You know, it can d damage your paint. It's a, yeah, I thought you, meant you were going to say it comes from Lyme Regis. <laughs> no. <laughs> Where the seagulls are prolific. <laughs> it comes from a seagull's chuff. <laughs> Bottom. <laughs> you can't say chuff. Can you not say chuff? No. Oh. No, it comes from a seagull. Seagull's bum. Mm. Yeah, well, we know where it comes from. That's just, that's <laughs> done in Cornwall, isn't it? 
<laughs> sea seagulls it's near Mausel <laughs> you didn't do very well at geography did you uh, where no, am so I? A, cub, a cub is a really good idea the other new innovation there's a company called Maypole and we sell their covers at thatleisureshop.com in fact we've been selling hundreds of them this season but they do a really great product called a topper which is literally a foot deep as it were and it just covers the roof and it ties down with straps onto the you know, the bottom of the vehicle, and they're really easy to put on. I mean, it's the roof that gets most of the dirt. You don't get the security benefit of a full cover, because obviously, you know, you're not hiding the vehicle. But they're a great idea. They've been really popular this year. I've learned something in being in this business over the last year. Isn't there some controversy about covers and humidity damaging your motorhome Ooh. or caravan? There, well, there has been for years, and I must admit, I used to subscribe to that, that they were bad. They were evil. But I have to say, I've had my mind changed. I've, I've been skewed. I'm, I'm a fan. I really am. The new covers, I have to say, are really breathable. The inside to them is really soft. They are feather soft. You know, they don't scratch the paint. They are, they're water resistant, not waterproof. And they're totally breathable. Um, I think they're a very good idea, a very sensible idea. So there you go, Matt's mind has been changed. It's the Motorhome Matt podcast brought to you with thatleisureshop.com. Remember, if you fancy a Christmas gift for somebody uh, who's got a motorhome, a caravan or likes going camping, thatleisureshop.com has its sale on at the moment. Motorhome Matt is your code. Put that in, you get a tenner off. Is that right? When you spend 100 oh yeah, you're welcome. And the January sale is coming in the new year as well. OK, then let's go into our audience Q&A. We love the Q&A and we love it when you ask us questions on Ask Matt. And Kevin has asked us a question. OK, um, what's the best motor home for uh, an ageing couple in the 60s and a small dog? Um, first motor home to, uh, to get. Um, I'd appreciate uh, some advice on this because uh, there are so many different variations about. Um, we pre prefer sleeping separately, but obviously not in a different area. So a rear bedroom um, for both beds would be great. Um, anyway, down to you, whatever you say. There you go, Matt. Kevin <laughs> says motor home for an ageing couple, and aren't we all ageing? <laughs> That's you and me. Every day they go. But, it, but it's a serious one, isn't it? Because yeah. it, it, you've got to think about these things. Uh, as people get older, maybe sometimes their mobility is a little bit restricted, just restricted. People get tired. Uh, they need to have a kip more often. It's true, yeah. isn't it? Or you just prefer a little bit of comfort. So what is the best motor home? Up and down a, in the night. Yeah, well, precisely. For a, for a, a beginner uh, looking for a motor home who is, let's just say, in the autumn of their years. <laughs> Nicely put, Keith. How romantic. Well, I have to say, Kevin, you've hit the nail on the head. The first thing to look at is how do you want to sleep? This is always the first question I have is how do you want to spend your night? So sleeping separately, I understand that in the same area. That probably means you're looking at two single beds, so a rear bedroom with single beds in it, or possibly a rear lounge where you get the U-shaped lounge and you can very quickly and easily make that into two single beds. It would easily become a double bed as well if you wanted it to. And often the single beds are linked and they can become a double bed too. I'd highly recommend looking at trying before you buy I know I'm, I run a motorhome hire business, but honestly, it's a huge sum of money. And I would say if you're not sure on the layout, then try before you buy and try a few different layouts. Try a rear lounge. The compromise with a rear lounge is often a lack of storage. So there's no big garage to put your bikes in, you know, and I've no idea if you like cycling or canoeing or barbecuing. All that stuff has to go somewhere. And when you've got a motorhome with a lounge, you don't have that storage space. With the single beds, very often they're, very, they're up high, and that gives you a big storage area, often big enough to put a small motorbike in. So you've got huge amounts of storage. But then there are layouts with low single beds, and that may be a benefit too, where there's often a bathroom across the back. Um, those don't link together to make a double bed because you've got an aisle at the middle, but they're a fantastic layout if you want single beds and you want to sleep kind of together but separately, if you know what I mean. You also mentioned you've got a dog, so I'd also be thinking about how's the dog going to travel. 
Remember, it needs to be clipped into a seat belt or attached to a seat belt. But is it traveling in a crate? So you need a floor space where the dog's crate can go or the dog's bed can go. So, you know, that needs thinking about as well. And the dog might sound odd this, but it will have a preference on where it travels. You know, is it happy sitting on a seat? Does it want to sit on the floor? So these are all factors to consider. And the only way you'll know that is if you, I would say, try a few before you buy one. Thanks very much, uh, Kevin. Christine has also uh, been recording her question on Ask Matt. Hello, Motorhome Matt. Um, we're very new to the uh, Motorhome family, and um, we've heard recently that um, in winter um, you need to winterise your motorhome, which we're, we've pretty much just that, I think. However, we heard mm. about fridge flaps this week. Um, do you need to cover your fridge vents um, with a fridge flap during the winter? Thanks very much, Christine. Fridge flaps. <laughs> <There's>... <laughs> <laughs> it takes Maddie this. I just said the word fridge flaps. <laughs> just... <laughs> and a link to this speak pipe is brilliant. Well, I have to say, I've never heard them called fridge flaps. <laughs> what they normally call them, Matt? Um, blanking covers, I'd say, or fridge vent covers. There you go, um, Christine. There we are. We know what they're, they're, we know what they are called now. Mm -hmm. They they are a good idea to use when you're using the fridge when the temperature drops below eight degrees, particularly if you've got a absorption fridge or a condenser fridge. So, what do they do? They stop the amount of air being drawn in. Uh, so really cold air, because the fridge works by being warm on the outside, okay? And it percolates that heat up because heat rises, doesn't it? And it draws the cold air from inside the fridge out onto the back. And you've got this kind of crisscross zigzag um, percolator on the back. And the heat rises at the back of the fridge and out the top vent. So you've got a vent at the bottom to draw the air in draws the air from inside the fridge, sucks it up and out the top vent. If the air is really cold, the fridge has got to work much harder to draw the air inside the fridge out. Uh, and that's why you put these blanking covers on so you draw a lot less cold air. So it's a in. bit counterintuitive. For your fridge to get cold, it needs to suck in warm air. Yeah, well, they say, don't they, if you put your domestic fridge in the garage in the cold, that's really inefficient. Bad idea, or the freezer. Really bad idea because it uses a lot more energy to get cold. Which sounds odd, doesn't it? And it is counterintuitive. So that's why that's why they they need the the covers when it's very cold, and also why they don't work when it's really hot, because if the air outside you know, is what is warm, the air from the fridge won't rise, so the air the fridge doesn't get cold. So Christine should be using her blanking covers, should she? She should, especially if she's using the fridge below eight degrees, and also they're a great idea when you're putting it into storage because uh, they stop the spiders and. You know, little rodents getting in the fridge vents. Uh, you wouldn't want that. Christine, thanks very much for your question. And by the way, if people want to put audio to their question, what should they do? If you go to motohomemat.co.uk forward slash ask Matt, hit the orange button, record your question. Remember to tell us your name and where you're from. And then we'll get the question included on the podcast. Yeah, where you're from. Important. Andy has left a note for us. I'm looking to get a bike rack to go on my T5 camper van. I'm not sure what the pros and cons are for a door-mounted rack versus one that fits onto a tow bar. Mm. Can you advise? Good question, yeah. I think uh, the first question I have is, is it a tailgate or are they barn doors? So two doors that open one uh, weight is a factor and consideration to how heavy are the bikes if you've got electric bikes even without the batteries they're going to be quite heavy uh, and that weight on the back door may not be the best idea um, there'll be a guideline to that on the vehicle you've got and also on the bike rack uh, that's where a tow bar mounted bike rack is really good because they'll take a lot more weight um, Often a door-mounted rack is limited at around 55 kilos, whereas a tow bar bike rack could be limited to 120 kilos. Um, it's about what weight the vehicle can carry as well. So that's a factor. But bear in mind, if you fit a tow bar rack, you may not be able to open the back doors, which is you know, a bit of an inconvenience, really. And that's where tailgate or back door bike racks are really helpful because the doors will open with the bikes on. 
Fine, thanks very much for that, uh, Andy. Irene's in Essex. She says we're embarking on a second travel adventure. Retirement, here we come. Way! Our first venture is to Spain, pulling Tiny Dancer in our birthday month of May. Any quick do's and don'ts for us teenage oldies? Now, I, I actually got in touch with Irene and said, what is Tiny Dancer? Is it a car or a caravan? Didn't want to assume. And Tiny Dancer is a caravan. So it's a caravan holiday they're off on to. I didn't know if they were towing a car behind a motorhome because that has different rules, you see, particularly on the continent. Uh, Perhaps we'll talk about that another time. But I would say, Irene, do your research. Google is going to definitely be your friend. I would also consider getting in touch with people like Alan Rogers. They have some fantastic research done on campsites. So they will pay people to go off and research sites all over the continent. And they have a fantastic range of books. And there are also some companies that do special trips, escorted trips as well, where you could join in with a group of other like-minded people. And you've got that then, that safety net and security as you go on that trip and you're not doing it necessarily alone. But research, 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 definitely. Cheers, Irene. Appreciate that. John's in Canterbury. Is it worth getting the underneath legs for being stable or just carry on using chocks? Right, OK. Well, they're kind of different things, really. So the chocks will get you level so i presume john you mean the ramps the ramps you drive on they will help you level up the vehicle which means you're sleeping on the flat your sinks and shower are going to drain properly and most importantly you won't lose your gnt across the table that's the most important bit of being level whereas the lower down legs will stop the van rocking so i'd say if you're in a vehicle that has a tendency to rock left to right often an older Ford Transit will do that because the wheelbase is narrower uh, or you're going away and it's very windy um, or when you're moving around you find that the van moves around quite a lot then those legs are a really good idea but remember they carry a weight so they will impact the payload um, and they also need to be fitted to the chassis. So you need to make sure you've got somewhere underneath that you can fit them safely. Don't just be screwing them to the bottom of your wooden floor, for example, because they are highly likely to go through it. Well, thanks very much, uh, John, from Canterbury. And remember, uh, when you ask the questions or even write them down, tell us where you're from. It really does help us and it gets us an idea of where you're listening as well, which is great. Thanks for all those questions. Uh, John and his uh, rocking camper van or caravan there. Uh, You advised Andy on his back doors uh, and his bikes. And of course, Christine and her flaps. Thanks for everybody for those wonderful questions. How do people ask Matt? They can go to motorhomemat.co.uk forward slash ask Matt. Fantastic. It's the Motorhome Matt podcast brought to you with that leisure shop dot com. Let's mention again uh, from now until the end of December, you should be buying your your loved ones or people who are uh, hobbyists in this industry. Something nice from that leisure shop dot com in your sale. What exactly do you give them? Gosh, there's a huge choice. If you love someone who or want a gift, for someone that has a motorhome caravan or camper van or tent, or even you just want a novel garden gift, we have got a range of stuff for all sorts of travel, uh, for all sorts of adventures, garden furniture, uh, torches, stocking fillers are plenty. They really are, even solar showers. So you can have a sh- warm shower from a bag. Genius. And if you want some inspiration, then listen to last week's episode where we ran through a load of our Christmas gift ideas. Fantastic. So what's the deal when they go on to thatleisureshop.com buying before Christmas? Just enter the discount code MOTORHOMEMAT at the checkout and we'll give you an extra £10 off when you spend £100. Free money. Fantastic. Uh, (laughs) Thanks very much for listening to the Motorhome Matt podcast. As I say, brought to you with our friends at thatleisureshop.com. How do people get in touch and give us the socials as well and tell us what buttons we need to be pressing so the Motorhome Matt podcast just automatically comes up on people's feeds. Indeed. (laughs) You make it sound really complicated. It's not. Just go to motorhomemat.co.uk and there you will find all the places you can listen to us. There are an increasing amount, you know, where you can listen to this podcast or you can watch us on YouTube. You'll find us on YouTube. And when you get there, just search Motorhome Matt. Make sure you click the like button and the subscribe bell and then YouTube will tell you when a new episode comes out. We're on Facebook, Instagram, we're everywhere. You'll find them all at the website. And remember, if you are listening on Apple or Spotify, please 
leave us a five star review keeps us both very happy and enthused doesn't it and it helps the algorithm that's no. Albert Gorithm, by the way I've no idea what that means mm. see you next time